And so while we are at it, let's talk a little bit about the cryptographic hash function. A hash function takes any bit string or file or document of arbitrary size as input and produces an output of 256 bits. So this is depicted here. The, the age of X is some string of size 256. And 256 is really, really a very large number. It's about the number of atoms there are in the universe. So the chance that two different strings x, x prime have the same hash is, is truly negligible. Um, but we know they, these strings must exist, okay, because we are mapping from a larger space. I mean, the, the, the input string potentially can be of arbitrary size. And we are mapping from a larger space into the smaller space of 2 to the 256. I mean, it's smaller, but, but still it's large, but it's finite. So we know by the pigeonhole principle that there must be two different strings which have the same hash value. But it should be infeasible to find such pairs. And this is truly important. It's important that you understand this property. Um, so you may ask the question, how, how many bits do we need? And so an 80-bit message digest is really insecure. There is this, this thing known as Yuval's birthday attack, which does the following. We create, a, we create a set of 2 to the 40 versions of some legitimate message, say, say a recommendation letter. And this may seem difficult, but it's actually it's not. You can play with formulation, punctuation, white space characters, control characters. The, this, the yellow phrase that you see there, it has um, 10 different options. So that means that overall we can have two to the power of 10 alternatives. So if we have a slightly longer document, it's easy to create two to the uh, power 40 versions of, of this message. And we can also create a forgery. Maybe it's an IOU saying that um, you, you one, one party owes money to the other. Um, and then what we're going to do, we're going to uh, apply the hash to the good message set. So we take all the all the good messages and we apply the hash to it and we take the bad message set and we also apply the hash to all these messages and by variation of the birthday paradox we can show that the the intersection of the two set is very likely to be non-empty okay so that means that um, in, in the two sets in there must be a pair of a good message and a bad message which have the same hash. So this is a collision. And now what the adversary does, it convinces Alice maybe to use her private key to sign the good message. But now since the hashes are the same, the adversary can change the message that has been signed and so can, can claim that uh, Alice signed a bad message. So this is a, a summary of, of uh, your false birthday attack. Um, you, you may change the parameters slightly, but, but essentially this is, this is uh, very, very worrying. Um, so if we look at, uh, at the conclusion to determine the security level of a hash function, we should divide the length of the hash by two. Okay, so this is why we need at least 160 bit hash, but actually um, these, these have been broken. I'll, I'll get, get to that shortly. First, let me um, mention the security properties. We have one way function, but we, we need something stronger. We need weak collision, uh, but actually we need something stronger than that, which is called strong collision resistance which is exactly the property I stated in the previous slide, that it's not possible to find um, two messages X1 and X2, or X and X prime, which uh, result in the same hash. Okay, so, so 
it's important that you understand the, the importance the the importance of the strong collision resistance property. Now, if we look at existing cryptographic hash functions, there have been standardized uh, a couple of them. Um, MD5 was uh, developed by, by Ron Rivest and SHA-1 has been developed by, by NIST. Both have been broken. You cannot use them for any serious cryptographic purpose. So, um, we have the SHA-2 family of cryptographic hash functions. I, this, this phrase, I, I copied it almost literally from, from Wikipedia. Um, the thing about this family is that it uses the Merkle Damgaard structure and the same was true for SHA-1. SHA-1 has been broken, so there are people feel insecure about the, this, this construction. This is why we have a new set of standards, which is the SHA-3 function family, which is based on the sponge construction. Um, note that they provide the same, the same output sizes. Um, my focus will be on 256 or, or 512. There are some intermediate options, but we'll leave that out. Um, you should be aware that um, in, in the case of Ethereum, that um, Ethereum adopted Ketchak actually before it was standardized. There was a small change in it. So um, the, the, the hash function that Ethereum used is the original Ketchak submission. It's not what later became the, the SHA-3 standard. Okay. Um, in the case of zero-knowledge uh, protocols that we will discussed later on in this course. Um, the problem is that uh, zero-knowledge proofs perform computation over finite fields, but implementing bit operations over such finite fields is very expensive. Um, for instance, doing a shift or doing an exclusive or um, and, and ORs also, they are expensive. So, what we are seeing, we see different designs of, of new hash functions which try to get a good performance over, over prime fields. So there's a whole list here. Um, I'm not going to, to, to discuss this in this course, I just want you to be aware of the existence. For a good overview, see the link here down. Um, but you should also be aware that none of these uh, hash functions have existed for a very long time. Um, so you, you have to be uh, careful about the security. It may be that from one day to another, maybe one of these functions get broken and then you, you are in deep trouble if this is the function that you have implemented. Um, I also want you to be aware of the following fact. In many, many settings, we interpret a hash function as an external independent source of randomness. Um, strictly speaking, that is not correct since uh, the hash function that we have is deterministic, so the randomness isn't independent. But in many situations, we feel that this is not a problem or we, we like to get to a proof which otherwise would be, would be impossible. So, um, there is something which is called the random oracle model, which was by, created by Belair Rockaway, um, which is trying to, to model this. I'll, I'll be explaining in the next slide. But this random oracle model is not without it pitfalls. You should be aware of that too, but it's not uh, something I'm going to discuss now. So the random oracle model essentially tells us the following, that when you call an n-bit hash function in your program or your protocol, this would be identical to, call, to calling a subroutine H, which returns a uniformly sampled random bit string of the same size. So here you can see it. Um, you, you call a function X, and what you get is a random number, which is the H of X. However, we make an additional requirement. We want this oracle to be consistent. 
if if you if the same argument x is called a second time or a third fourth time then h of x will not sample a new value but it will return the the result that was used earlier so you can think of of uh, the oracle here as maintaining a key value table to to remember which um, which argument x was used before and to deliver the same uh, function value. So this is this is uh, depicted in this this thing here. Um, the word oracle you should know that uh, comes from complexity theory. It's a kind of a magic black box that computes some function in unit time. And this is useful in, in comparing um, complexity of, of some, some functions. So this is where the word uh, oracle comes from and the random oracle comes from the idea that it's delivering uh, a random string. Um, and so this, this concludes the fourth module. Um, we have been through this topic, Diffie-Hellman key exchange, discrete log, Algamal. Um, I talked quickly about elliptic curves. Um, the algorithm for finding the elliptic curves, um, including the, the polar draw algorithm, um, digital signatures based on this assumption and the hash function. There's an interesting thing I'd like to point out when, when comparing. Um, I mentioned that um, if we look at the security factor for elliptic curves, then the security factor uh, is like half of the size of the primes because of the because of the birthday paradox in the polar draw. We also have the same birthday paradox um, happening in the hash functions attack against hash functions. So we have the same same heuristic that um, to to get the complexity of an attack against a hash function you must divide the number of bits of it by two. So this is this is an important thing, an important heuristic to keep in mind. Okay, so this is where this lecture ends. Um, hope to see you back in the next one.